Church Online. Today we begin our final sermon series of 2024, which has been a year that we have focused on the truth that Jesus is Lord. Now we just finished the book of First Peter, and today we begin the book of James. You know, James is a, a short but powerful book. Strangely, it's often a forgotten book. Sometimes it's even been disrespected mostly because James kind of gets lost in the Apostle Paul's shadow. Additionally, James says things that seem to be inconsistent with Paul, which causes many to disregard James, or at the very least, be confused about how James's theology fits into the New Testament, which seems to be dominated by both Paul and Peter's theology. But here's the thing. While many ignore James today, they didn't do that in the early church because next to Peter, James was the guy in Jerusalem. In fact, the Apostle Paul answered to James and even called him a pillar. Did I mention that James is also the half-brother of Jesus? You would think that that fact alone would give him clout with the church. What's funny is James doesn't even mention it. Instead, he opens his letter this way. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. No mention of being related to Jesus, only that he is a servant of God. You know, that's a title that's used by many New Testament authors. But here's what's interesting about James's use. James is very Jewish, not only ethnically, but in personhood and theology. That is what he believed about God and how that impacted his worldview. And though Peter and Paul are Jewish too, the terms servant, servant of God works a little bit different with James, because when he uses it, it echoes of the Old Testament. When the title was used of Moses and of David and of other prophets, it, it rings of authority. It declares, listen to my words. And that's exactly how the recipients of this letter would have understood it. That's how they would have treated it. Because when James spoke, the church listened. And James also states that he's writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. In other words, he's writing to Jewish Christians. But at the same time, He's not only writing to Jewish Christians, but to all of the church, because in James's mind, a restored Israel, that is one that has found salvation in the Messiah, in the Savior, in Jesus, it included, a restored Israel included the nations of the world. And I mention this as we start the book of James because I believe that James's authoritative words have something to say to us today. And so we should listen just as the early church would have listened to him. We don't sleep on James. Honestly, I think we're going to find that James connects to us in many ways because James is, is kind of written in a conversation form. He's inviting us over for coffee and then talking with us about what it means to follow Jesus. Furthermore, James, James is like us. He knows what it's like to not follow Jesus because James mocked his brothers and it didn't become a, a, a thing where he was a believer until later on in his life. And so he personally understands what it's like to seriously doubt Jesus. Additionally, James is a peacemaker, and so a lot of his words are going to resonate with us. At the same time, a lot of his words are going to challenge us. That's what James does. He makes people uncomfortable because he is a peacemaker that often takes the middle position. You know, some people, they equate that to a person of compromise, and at times it can be, but not with James. With James, it means that he does not take sides. 
It reminds me a little bit of Joshua. You guys remember when Joshua is about to go into battle and he encounters the angel of the Lord or kind of an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. And it says that when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped him and said, what does my Lord say to his servant? The Lord was like, I ain't, I'm not on anybody's side. I'm on my own side. And that's kind of like James. James is not on anyone's side. He's on Jesus's side. And that makes people uncomfortable. So just be warned as we continue through this series that it's going to get uncomfortable. But you know what's cool with that is that we also skip the fluff. Meaning, honestly, James is, is very New England. I think you guys are going to love it. James is brutally in your face. But at the same time, James is full of love. Again, at least in my opinion, which is that's also very New England. You know, I think New England is 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 some of the most brutally honest people in our country, but at the same time they're also the most loving. Therefore, I believe that there is great potential for our church to really connect with this book. It makes me think of the Philippians. You know, Philippi was a Roman colony. What that means is that Rome saw them as a strategic outpost. And as a, as that was true, Rome made them an offer. They said, if you will give your allegiance to the empire, we will give you the benefits of Roman citizenship. And the Philippians agreed and they became loyal to Rome. But when the gospel invaded that city and called for them to be now loyal to Jesus and the kingdom of God, you know what? That actually was an easy transition because they already knew how to live that way. And it's why I believe that the Philippians were such a great church. And the longer that I pastor here in New England, the more I feel that way about us here. We already know how to be loyal. Honestly, that's what New Englanders do. They are loyal to their culture. They are loyal to their town. They are loyal to their teams. Right now, I'm wearing a Giants jersey for the most part here in Connecticut. You're either a Giants fan or a Patriots fan. And you're a fan even in seasons where your team is not doing well, like this season. We're still loyal. A Patriots fan will not put on this jersey, and a Giants fan is not going to put on a Patriots jersey. And in a couple of days, some of us are going to vote. And if we're honest, a lot of decisions will be made based on loyalty instead of what is right. All that to say is we know how to be loyal to the Lord Jesus because we do it in our everyday lives. It's just about simply now focusing that loyalty towards Jesus instead of all of these other New England things. And one of the purposes of James is to help us shift that focus onto Jesus, specifically through tough times, which is why verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Are you going through a hard time right now? Are you struggling? Well, then pay attention. Take some notes because James has something to teach us. And the very first thing is this, be joyful. It's kind of strange. Why, why, why would he say that? You know, the language that's used here for trials of various kind, it speaks of an unexpected external encounter that you have that when you're facing it, you get to this point where you're like, I can't even deal with it. Have you ever been there? If you have, then you know that your initial response is not joy. You want to try to fix the problem quickly or maybe lash out and blame others or maybe you want to fight back. And yet James says, my brothers or those of us who belong to God's family, your response is supposed to be joy. 
How? Well, look at what he says next. Verse 3, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Christian, something radical has happened to you. When you put your faith in Jesus as Lord, your life completely changed. You were brought into God's family, and that means something significant. It means that there are no more coincidences in your life and that you are never alone. Rather, God is now sovereignly guiding and protecting your life. Therefore, any trials or problems that come into your life must first pass through his permission. And all trials are allowed only because it's part of his process to produce endurance or what's been translated steadfastness, knowing that endurance produces perfection or spiritual maturity. In other words, as children of God, we can be joyful when we face trials because we know that this is God's special process to make us more like Jesus. And that is a good thing. You know, if you're taking notes, uh, you can put this down as point number one. God's transformation requires depending on him by faith. God desires to change our lives and trials mysteriously shape us into the type of people that he has created us and called us to be. But honestly, that process is not easy. It requires us to radically depend on God by faith, meaning we must trust God knows what he's doing, even if we don't. And James gets it. He understands the struggle, which is why he goes on to write in verse 5, If anyone of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. James knows how hard it is to properly process things, have a right perspective when you are experiencing pain. Nevertheless, the response of God's people is simple. If you are wondering what the heck is happening in your life, especially when everything is falling apart and you're doing your best to follow Jesus, what you need to do is you need to just simply ask God because God wants to and will give you clarity on this issue. But verse six continues, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Again, imagine James is here sitting down with us. He's got a coffee and a cinnamon scone, and like a good friend, he's been patiently listening. We've been pouring out our heart to him about how terrible life is and how we don't know what's going on and, 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 and you don't know or we don't know what God is doing. And then James looks at us and asks in a very uncomfortable way, do you even believe that Jesus is Lord? Because your current response seems to be one that's built more on doubt than faith. And what that really reveals is that you say you believe in God, but you really don't. You're double-minded. You're inconsistent. And in James's mind, as someone who grew up near the Sea of Galilee, where storms could appear out of nowhere and then toss a boat to and fro all over the place, he is looking at our lives as we're sharing. He's looking at how we're responding to things. And he sees the same thing, that our lives are all over the place because we have not really anchored into the rock who is Jesus. I mean, how, how do you describe your life? Are you, are you faithful? Are you anchored into Jesus? Or are you inconsistent? Do you respond to hard times with joy? 
Or are you a boat that's tossed by the waves of the storm? Man, that, that, that's uncomfortable. But here's the truth. Jesus is always consistent, and he desires to transform us more into his likeness, to be always faithful, always consistent. And right now, he's using James to confront us so that we can change so that we can be joyful in trials, so that we can fix our perspective. And if necessary, understand that we need to be asking God for wisdom in these moments so that we can faithfully endure and stop being inconsistent. Verse 9, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and it withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. One of the specific trials that the church experienced was poverty. That is, Christians financially struggling because of the abuse of rich people in their community. And yet, James still says, be joyful. There's purpose in this poverty. This will eventually result in exaltation. That is you becoming more like Jesus. You know what? Are you financially struggling right now? Maybe at no fault of your own? Well, then remember that there is purpose behind your suffering, that God sees you, that he loves you, and he is faithful to his promise to exalt you out of this low moment. You just have to trust him. And remember that acquiring riches won't fix the situation. Riches are inconsistent. They are temporary. Don't put your trust in them. Just fix your perspective. This season, what you must see is that this season is meant to put your hope in the Lord. But we got to ask, what if we are rich and we follow Jesus? Is, is James saying that our wealth is incompatible with the kingdom? Not necessarily, but it also depends on how we use it. We got to ask, what's the posture of your heart towards money? Because money isn't evil. The love of money is. And Paul said this. He said, as for the rich in this present age, Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life." Are you rich? Is that how you steward your wealth that God has given you? If so, then James's words do not apply to you. But if not, maybe it's time to ask the Lord how you can better invest the resources he's given you so that you can be all in. Verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Again, Jesus is transforming our lives and blessed, happy in the best way possible is the person who depends on God by faith, no matter what trial they are facing. But look at the phrase crown of life. You know, there's a lot of thoughts about what this means, but here's what I know. When I hear that my reward for faithfully enduring suffering in this life is the crown of life, I get about excited as a fourth grader opening socks and underwears for Christmas. By the way, every illustration falls apart at some point because the older you get, you actually like, you begin to like getting socks and underwear, at least I do. But when James's original audience heard that their reward was the crown of life, they would have been like, 
what, bro? We got to lock in. We got to go get that. Let's go. So, so why is it that I don't respond that way now? Well, it's because I am too focused on this world instead of heaven. And that's just real. My friends, James, again, he is in our face this morning. We are not excited enough about Jesus and his promises because we are too in love with this world. And we don't really understand how wonderful his promises are. And that's because we really don't understand him. And the early church dealt with the same problem. Because verse 13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. You know, it's probably better translated this way. Let no one say when he is tested, I am tempted by God. Because here's what was happening. People were facing God-ordained trials, and then they were responding the wrong way. But then they were blaming God and saying, you know what? God is the one who made me sin. He gave me more than I could handle. It's not my fault. And James replies, that's impossible. Because God can't tempt people. He cannot sin or cause people to sin. And the implication is, do you even really know God? You know, that happens today too, right? In its own way, people kind of form opinions about God based on what they've heard instead of the truth or actually based on what their personal encounter or experience or relationship with him has shown them. And then what happens is God gets blamed for problems that are actually our fault. And that's why James says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it it has conceived, uh, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Hey, everybody out there say, I'm the problem, not God. When we respond the wrong way to life, when we respond sinfully, It's our fault. It's because we were unwilling to depend on God by faith. Instead, we trust our desires, our feelings, and that gives birth to sin, which results in death. For the past couple of months, I've been meeting weekly with a team of people at our church to study the sermon passage together. And and this past week, uh, our our friend James suggested that, uh, that uh, suggested a passage that seems to be a consistent way to explain this sin birthing process based on the very Jewish mind of James. And that is the author, not my friend who's suggesting it. But in the book of Genesis, we are introduced to very mysterious characters. You know, the world is is in sinful rebellion, and it says that the sons of God, these divine evil beings, they, they mate with human women who, who give birth to creatures that mature into beings called Nephilim. And then the world multiplies in wickedness, which then leads to the Lord regretting that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of of the land, uh, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I made them. And then shortly after came the flood, the destruction and death of the world with the exception of Noah's family. You know, that that's a harsh but relevant example of what's birthed in our lives. Because we have these wicked desires, and that wickedness matures into actual sin, which then multiplies into destruction and death. That's what sin does. Sin is no joke. And when it happens, it's our fault, not God's, because James clarifies, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In other words, it is impossible for God to do anything but good. Therefore, the inappropriate responses of our lives is due to our own sin, not God. So don't blame God. Instead, look in the mirror. Think about what's going on in my life. 
What am I allowing to mature in my life? Is it sin that is multiplying or are we let, letting Jesus shape us even through trials into a spiritually mature child of God? You know, some of those questions are going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Thankfully, our conversation with James doesn't end with uncomfortable questions. Because here's the truth that James would have been very familiar with. Ezekiel 18 says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn and live. You know, no matter how we answer those uncomfortable questions, there is always good news. And the good news is that God loves us and he doesn't want anyone to die. In fact, James says, God is allowing these trials for one huge purpose. And he writes it this way, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I want us to think about the verse this way, of God's own will, meaning God chooses us. He brought forth by the word of truth, meaning that God has this good plan and it includes trials that we should become a kind of first fruits uh, so, so, so that we would become part of his beloved family. You know, let me ask you this. Are you in God's family or not? You know, if you're still taking notes, you can write this down. Point number two would be this. We can trust God's transformation process because he is good. This morning, God has led us to this moment, likely through a series of events, a series of trials and responses. And he has one good goal in mind, and that is to bring us into his family and or make us more like his son, Jesus. And at this moment, I, I want to play a little video for you of my friend Jordan, who is sharing a story of how God has been personally showing her this. Hi, my name is Jordan Owens, and I just wanted to share a little story of what God did in my life recently. Um, I was thinking about how I wanted to be closer to God and feel his presence more rather than just going through the motions. I wanted to draw nearer to him and feel closer, but I wasn't feeling very self-motivated to take the active steps that would help me do that. Uh, you know, I knew that reading my Bible, praying more, all of those would help me feel his presence and be closer to him, but I needed a push. And so I was asking God to help me with that, uh, to help me get over those distractions and um, take those steps. Almost immediately after I started praying this, my anxiety, just daily level of anxiety, started getting worse. Uh, my self-esteem was taking hits. I was worrying about things that just weeks before I had felt totally fine about. Uh, and because of all of that worry, I started feeling the temptation to uh, turn to my worldly coping mechanisms that would make me feel better in the moment. And although I wanted to do those things, I started making more choices to push back against that temptation. And I instead started reading the Bible more, started praying to him because I was crying out for his help with that anxiety. I was searching in the Bible for answers to all of my fears and for comfort and reassurance. And I started getting closer to God. I was feeling his presence more and I was reflecting on that and realized that God had directly answered my prayer. Uh, I had asked him to give me a push and he had done that by um, putting me in that situation that inspired me to draw closer to him because I had asked him to do that. It wasn't um, suffering for suffering's sake. I was, was feeling God answering my prayer, answering my request because I had called out for him. Um, and because I know God's character, because of my pre-existing relationship with him, I'm able to look at that and know that he loves me and that he is good. I'm able to look at that trial as something that gave me a perspective that allowed me to experience the blessing of being close to him.
So as we close, what is God doing in your life? Remember, God loves you. He wants to transform your life. He's got a good process to do that, but you must trust him. You must be loyal to him in the process, even when it involves difficult trials. But here's the good news. You already know how to do this. Just as you know how to be loyal to your hometown or to your home team or even your political party this Tuesday. You know how to do this, which, by the way, let me just say this. I know you guys know that I don't really talk a lot about politics. And honestly, I don't plan on doing that. But I heard my friend Sean say this the other day, and he said this. I'm not really concerned about what the election will bring. I'm more concerned about what Jesus is bringing. You know what? That's that, that's me for better or for worse. And now that doesn't mean that politics don't matter. It just means that Jesus means infinitely more. He matters infinitely more. We're going to put our trust in him. And so on Wednesday, if you guys are watching this on Sunday, you you may see someone in office and you may even view that as an unexpected trial. Here's the good news. James has already told us how to properly respond to that circumstance. And it's that we trust. Trust in the goodness of God by faith. And don't forget that your responsibility on Tuesday is ultimately to be loyal to Jesus. You live here. You should participate in things here, but you are a citizen of heaven. Therefore, consider what God's word says and then vote according to your faithfulness to God. And then once you put your sticker on and then post on social media that you voted, because I guess it doesn't count unless you do that, continue loving God and loving people. Amen? Let's pray. Father, you are in control. I trust you with my life, even when it hurts. Please help me to see the purpose behind the pain and help me to be loyal to your kingdom. Forgive me for my sins. Fill me with my spirit, with your spirit and help me to be all in for Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. <laughs>